It's always a good idea to pray before, during, and after we preach, but when we deal with a story like the one today, it's an especially good idea. So let's breathe deeply and let's pray together. Holy One, we give thanks for communities of faith that hold on to the difficult stories, for remember, who remember the difficult parts as well as the easy ones. And as we gather this morning, I pray that you might speak through me or in spite of me, so that together we might receive your word and together we might become your people for this, your world, that you so dearly love. In Jesus' name, we read and struggle and pray together. Amen. The Presbyterian author, writer, teacher extraordinaire, Anne Lamott, shares one of the most powerful stories I've read about sacrifice in her book, Bird by Bird, some instructions on writing and life. She writes that an eight-year-old boy was, was talking with his younger sister and his parents. They had just found out that she had leukemia and that she would likely die. And so his parents explained to him that he might be a blood match, and so he could be a donor, and they asked him if he was willing to get tested. He said that he had to think about it overnight. He wasn't sure. But the next day, they came to his parents, and he said he was willing to donate the blood, and so they took him to the hospital where he was put on a gurney beside his six-year-old sister. Both of them were hooked up to IVs, and the boy lay on his gurney in silence, until the doctor showed up. And as the doctor asked him how he was doing, he opened his eyes and said, how long until I start to die? And thank goodness, that's not how blood transfusions work. But nonetheless, I think there's something that Father Abraham in our Bible story today could learn from this son, this brother in that story. Unfortunately, Abraham has this other habit to always look out for how other people can sacrifice themselves for him, not the other way around. Within the larger story in Genesis, we see four examples where Abraham attempts to sacrifice anyone else rather than be vulnerable and courageous himself. And each time we see a pattern with these stories, somehow Abraham's family, his connection, his identity is hidden or distorted. And then a sacrifice is made or attempted to be made, and then God intervenes to stop the sacrifice before it happens. Early on in Genesis, Abraham lies about his wife Sarah's relationship, her identity, in exchange for his safety. Abraham sacrifices Sarah, gives her over to the Egyptian pharaoh, and God intervenes to stop it. Later, he lies about Sarah's identity again, this time to King Abimelech. He gives her to Abimelech without any regard for her well-being, her safety, her life. And God again acts to stop the sacrifice. Finally, Sarah, she does some identity distortion of her own. She hides the identities of Hagar, Abraham's other wife, and Ishmael, Abraham's other son. And he doesn't acknowledge his familial connections to his mother and this child. She asks Abraham to send Hagar and Ishmael away to a certain death in the desert without adequate provisions. But again, God provides to stop the sacrifice. So having read these three stories of near familial sacrifice, scholars point out that we really shouldn't be surprised when it's Isaac's turn to be put up on the block this time. So far in the Genesis story, Isaac is the only member of Abraham's family who has been unscathed by his cowardice and his penchant for self-protection. And I think we might also ask, what about gender and class and ethnicity? have made this story of Isaac's near sacrifice the great question of faith that we have to wrestle with. Why are we comfortable with Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah being up on the block? Because that's just part of the story. But we can't fathom the idea of losing Isaac. I wonder what other sacrifices today we're willing to accept without much question. And in our story today, this fourth example of Abraham trying to sacrifice anyone except for himself, God reverses this pattern of dishonesty at the very beginning. This time, 
God is the one who hides the identity. It's God who hides who Isaac is. God tests Abraham by asking him to sacrifice Isaac, but each time that God or God's messenger in this story speaks, they refer to him in a very specific way. Who remembers how he's referred to? Isaac is his son, his only son. And just like that repetition last week in Genesis 2, God saw that it was good. We, we need to pay attention when the Bible starts repeating something. That's usually a clue to watch out for something. Each time we hear that Isaac is his son, his only, only son. But that's not true. That is a lie. He's not his first son. He's not his only son. And I wonder if this repeated phrase draws us toward the real test that God is posing. After lying about who Sarah is, who Hagar is, who Ishmael is, will Abraham break this pattern when tempted with it by God himself? What if God is not testing whether Abraham is willing to murder his child to show his loyalty or his faith? What if instead God is testing whether Abraham will finally speak out when his family is in danger, when another sacrifice looms? What if the story is really about Abraham learning to recognize that the way of denying and sacrificing his family is not God's way? before Abraham has refused to speak the truth when his family's well-being is in danger. And in our story today, Abraham is still silent at first. But that changes when Isaac questions him. In verse 7, we get this simple but powerful question from Isaac, where is the lamb for the offering? I wonder if Isaac is saying, surely you're not going to do this again, Dad. That's not who you are. You are better than this. And I think Isaac's question makes something click deep down inside of Abraham. Because Abraham affirms right then and there that he's not going to sacrifice his family this time. Somehow God will provide a lamb, not Isaac, for the sacrifice. And I think that's the breakthrough statement of faith that, that marks Abraham's transformation. He recognizes that God will provide. He can protect his family rather than forsake them. He notices there's a different way to live life together. Before Abraham tries to sacrifice Sarah the first time, way back near the beginning of Genesis, Abraham has this foundational conversation with God that, that kind of sets up this promise that God makes that shapes much of the rest of our Bible. God tells Abraham that his family will be a great nation, that they'll be blessed, and that through his family, all the people of the world are going to be blessed, too. And I wonder if, if that's where the confusion comes in. I, I wonder if Abraham hears that he'll be blessed, and he, he knows that blessing requires sacrifice, but he misunderstands how sacrifice works. All of us who are called and claimed beloved by God have been blessed to be a blessing, yes. But we're in trouble if we think that our blessing means that we get to pitch others up on the altar. As Abraham's family learns, and I think as all of us on this journey of faith learn, we who are called to be a blessing to all the earth are tested. But we're the ones that are tested and asked to live sacrificial lives, giving ourselves, our wealth, our concern. I think that's the sacrifice that brings forth God's blessing. That's the offering that we're all called to make and keep making together. That's what the prophets repeatedly call the Hebrew people to nor the, near the end of our First Testament, to live sacrificial lives of justice and mercy rather than offer grain and animal sacrifices. And I think that's the test that God poses to Abraham in our story today, to stop putting his family on the altar and to dare to live a vulnerable, courageous, sacrificial life himself for the sake of the world's well-being. My ethics professor in seminary, Dr. Sandra Wheeler, said that Christianity involves a test like this. She said that Christianity has a final exam and it's pass or fail. She liked to say that we take that final exam every single day of our life. Every time we talk to a stranger, help a neighbor, pass by a situation we'd rather ignore. And I think Dr. Wheeler is right. There's a final exam for our faith. There's a test, and we are called to sacrifice. 
but it's not our children, our families, those closest to us that we're being asked to give up. It's our comfort, our privilege, our apathy, so that the whole world might be blessed, so that God's love might flow to everyone, no exceptions. Please pray with me. Holy One, for those days when we are tested to love and live differently, to give of ourselves rather than expecting something of others, we give thanks. We ask for your presence, your patience, and good friends to do that work alongside. In Jesus' name, we stay committed, we question, and we do the work. In his name, amen.